Unlike the rest of Texas, mountains are a big part of El Paso. From Scenic Drive in the heart of El Paso, two markers tell of the mountains and the city. This point provides a breathtaking view of the El Paso Rio Grande Valley and our sister city of Juarez, Mexico. The area south of the river was settled by Spaniards in the 1650s. They called it El Paso del Rio del Norte, meaning the crossing of the river. When settlements began on the north side of the river in the 1800s, they had names like Frontera, Hart's Mill, Franklin, McGoffinsville, and Concordia. After several ownership changes, the area north of the Rio Grande became El Paso, Texas, and the city south of the river became Juarez, Mexico. From El Paso's scenic drive, which is a city park, you can see the Rio Grande River Channel that has now been cemented to keep the river, and therefore the international boundary, from changing with the weather. At Scenic Point, there are also several bronze plaques that describe events and places in historic El Paso. Some geologists will tell you that El Paso's Franklin Mountains are the southernmost tip of the Rocky Mountains. From Scenic Drive, El Paso's Franklin Mountains extend for 15 miles through the city to the New Mexico state line. Most of the mountain is now a Texas state park with about 24,000 acres, which is the largest urban park in the United States. The Franklin Mountain State Park includes the Weiler Aerial Tramway, which takes visitors to the top of Ranger Peak. The tramway provides a spectacular view of two countries and three states. From this vantage point at 5,600 feet elevation, you can see thousands of square miles and accept the fact that El Paso is in the mountains and that the mountains are a big part of El Paso. The first Europeans who came to El Paso in the 1500s found Native American people living here. The river in the desert provided for food and water to many peoples over the centuries, and there is evidence of prehistoric dwellings in the El Paso area. The El Paso Museum of Archaeology in Northeast El Paso provides a look at these ancient people and those who have lived here since then. The climate was more moderate after the Ice Age and woolly mammoths roamed the El Paso area. They were hunted and provided food and shelter for the tribes here. In more recent times, Pueblo Indians traveled the El Paso area, leaving behind some of their pottery and other artifacts that helped tell their story. Many tribes were in the El Paso area, and they left their marks on the stones as well. At the El Paso Museum of Archaeology, dioramas show what we have learned about their homes and how they lived. Modern descendants of the Apaches show museum visitors some of their ceremonial clothing and dances. The indigenous people at first welcomed the Spaniards to the area, but as the Spanish began to take their food and control their lives, the El Paso natives rebelled and began years of clashes between the Europeans and themselves. The result is that all of El Paso's original tribes were assimilated. The Tigua and Piro Indians now living in El Paso were brought here from northern New Mexico by the Spaniards in the 1600s. The El Paso Museum of Archaeology is a good way to experience El Paso's early history. Five thousand years ago, when Egyptians were building pyramids, there were people already living in the El Paso area. They lived in a large village of pit houses at what is now known as the Keystone Site. It is the only known archaic settlement of its size in North America, and it almost disappeared in 1999 when a developer announced plans to build on the site. The ancient Keystone people were some of the earliest farmers when most other people followed animal herds and gathered seasonal plants for food. This village was built beside a drainage channel, or arroyo, from the Franklin Mountains that emptied into the Rio Grande. Fish, fowl, and small game were abundant, and because the village was on higher ground, it was safe from seasonal flooding. The Keystone site was discovered by the Army Corps of Engineers, who were preparing to construct a flood control dam. 
the plans were changed, and the dam was built around the ancient village site. Years went by and the land was sold. Then in 1999, a group of El Pasoans united to save the archaic site from development by purchasing the property with donations and grants. Today, there is a desert botanical garden on the 50-acre site and plans for a visitor center to explain the history of Keystone. It will also provide a vantage point for bird watchers. Future archaeological work may help us understand how the first El Paso residents made their life here 5,000 years ago. To visit El Paso's Keystone site, call 915-584-0563. Native American rock art provides a unique view of human history. One of the most important rock art sites in North America is found at Waco Tank State Historic Site in eastern El Paso County. This 860-acre park of ancient volcanic rock outcrop has attracted travelers for centuries because rainwater collects in basins and hollow spaces known as Wacos. Native Americans, Spaniards, followed by Pioneers, the Butterfield Stage Line, and Cowboys all stopped here for the water found in the Wacos. 8,000 years ago, Native Americans began creating pictographs and petroglyphs. Waco Tanks has the largest collection of pictograph masks in North America, numbering over 200. Native American descendants still come here to use Waco Tanks as a ceremonial center for their tribes, just as their ancestors did. These are two of the most often photographed and also best preserved examples of painted masks at Waco Tanks. Each year, visitors are treated to Native American dancers at the October Interpretive Fair featuring food, arts, and crafts. In addition to the rock art, Waco Tanks is famous as a world-class rock climbing site. Guided tours and camping are available. The number of visitors is limited to protect both natural and cultural resources. So call for a reservation to Waco Tanks, a Texas State Historic Site. At a ford in the Rio Grande near downtown on May 4, 1598, Don Juan de Oñate first named the location as El Paso del Rio del Norte. It is a snow-free route from the Atlantic to the Pacific through the Rocky Mountains, and everything from railroads, pipelines, and the internet goes through this mountain pass. Don Juan de Oñate was commissioned by the King of Spain to claim and colonize the New Mexico region. Oñate and his party of 400 men and their families left Santa Barbara in northern Mexico in January 1598. Instead of following the earlier routes, they crossed the Chihuahuan Desert to reach the El Paso area. On April 30th, 1598, Oñate issued a proclamation known as La Toma. In a ceremony, he took possession of the region for Spain, whether the locals liked it or not. The claim included all land drained by the Rio del Norte or Rio Grande. Oñate established headquarters near present Santa Fe and founded the province of New Mexico, becoming its first governor. Oñate's expedition and La Toma brought Spanish rule to the American Southwest 23 years before the Pilgrims' famous landing at Plymouth Rock. The Spanish moved the Tigua tribe from northern New Mexico to the El Paso area in the wake of the 1680 Pueblo Revolt. More Tiguas followed, and in 1682, the Spanish directed them to build a mission church about 20 miles downriver from the main Guadalupe mission at El Paso del Norte. The Tigua Indians have preserved their history at the Tigua Cultural Center, a half mile from the Isleta mission. The center depicts the Tigua history as prosperous farmers and how they lost the land granted to them by the King of Spain. Their Pueblo Indian heritage is still part of their traditions and are to be shared with visitors through dance at the Tigua Cultural Center. 
The Tigua Cultural Center includes a small museum that deals with the Tigua history and has displays of pottery, clothing, and jewelry. There are also gift shops and there are traditional bread baking demonstrations and the fresh bread baked in hornos is for sale. The Pueblo has free dance performances that take place on weekends. Please call for hours. Each performance ends with an invitation to participate in an Indian friendship dance or round dance. Beyond the cultural center is the Tigua Reservation, which is their residential community built of adobe. Visitors are allowed to walk around, but are asked to bear in mind that these are private homes. If you plan to visit, you may want to arrange your trip to coincide with the Feast of St. Anthony held each June. Corpus Christi de la Isleta, or the Isleta Mission, is the first mission in Pueblo in Texas. It was established in 1682 and was maintained by Franciscans to Christianize the Tiwa Indians. To the Tiwas, the mission church is known as San Antonio, after their patron saint, and they call the Pueblo Isleta del Sur. The present church was constructed in 1851. Its distinctive silver-domed bell tower was added in 1897. In 1881, the Jesuits took over the church and renamed it Nuestra Señora del Monte Carmelo. Fire severely damaged the structure in 1907, but it was soon repaired. The Mission Pueblo is about 15 miles southeast of the site of modern Ciudad Juarez. As a result of flooding, the Rio Grande altered its course to the south and west leaving Isleta on the north bank of the main channel. By the terms of the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the main course of the Rio Grande was the international boundary between the United States and Mexico. Hence, Isleta became United States territory. In 1967, the Texas legislature recognized the tribal status of the Tiguas and established the Tigua Reservation, one of only three reservations in Texas. The Isleta Mission is an active Catholic church, and visitors are asked to respect the sanctity of the church and its activities. Nuestra Señora de la Limpia Concepción del Socorro Mission and the town of Socorro owe its establishment to the 1680 Pueblo Revolt in New Mexico. Spanish and Piro refugees from Socorro, New Mexico named their new mission and town for the one they left behind. Franciscan pastor Antonio Guerrera marked the founding of the town with a mass on October 13, 1680, 15 miles from El Paso del Norte. Flooding of the Rio Grande has destroyed the mission on several occasions, but the vigas, or ceiling timber, has been saved and each time the church was rebuilt. In 2005, the Socorro Mission finished a five-year renovation that has fully restored the old church from top to bottom with new adobe bricks. The bells were rehung in August of 2005, and the Socorro Mission was formally rededicated that year. The Socorro Mission, like the Isleta Mission, is an active Catholic church. Please call for times to visit the Socorro Mission.
In 1789, the Presidio of San Elizario was moved up the Rio Grande to the Hacienda of Tibercios, the approximate site of the present town of San Elizario. Unlike the missions, which were churches for Indians, a Presidio was a fort. The Presidio was to protect the river settlements of Isleta and Socorro and establish a colony of pacified Apaches. The perimeter enclosure with its thick adobe walls included quarters for four officers, barracks for 43 soldiers, guardhouses, corrals, storerooms, and a chapel for the soldiers. The shape of the chapel sets it apart from the missions. The building is rectangular rather than the traditional cruciform. Today the San Elizario Presidio Chapel is more rare than Spanish missions. San Elizario Presidio had provided the nucleus for the development of a town that grew to more than 1,000 people by 1841. The Rio Grande had formed a new channel south of Isleta, Socorro, and San Elizario, placing these settlements on what amounted to an island known as La Isla. Living conditions were primitive and poverty was widespread. When El Paso County was established in March 1850, San Elizario became the county seat. In 1851, John Russell Bartlett, the U.S. Boundary Commissioner, found the old Presidio in ruins. The settlers had dismantled the walls and buildings to obtain adobe to construct their own residences and today's chapel. The Presidio Chapel has been restored and is an active Catholic church. Please call the Portales Museum on the San Elizario Square for museum and chapel hours. While visiting in San Elizario, schedule a tour of the old county jail. Tradition holds that Billy the Kid once broke into this jail to free a friend. Early Spanish explorers traveled a route through El Paso known as the Camino Real, or the Royal Road, an official Spanish highway. Opened by the colonizing expedition of Juan de Oñate in 1598, the trail connected Mexico City with northern New Mexico, bringing missionaries, colonists, soldiers, and merchants into the area. It became a famous transportation corridor in today's American Southwest. One of the oldest, longest, and most historic roads in the Americas. The first horses, European crops, livestock, and arms entered New Mexico through the Camino Real. By the time Santa Fe was established in 1610, the Camino Real stretched 1,600 miles, reaching the farthest outpost of the Spanish Empire. The trail crossed the Chihuahuan Desert and passed through the Mission Valley, connecting the settlements of San Elizario, Socorro, and Isleta to the Guadalupe Mission in today's Ciudad Juarez. The trail crossed the river near downtown El Paso and continued north into New Mexico. Later, segments of the Camino Real became the base of our modern railroad and highway system. In the early 19th century, American traders followed the Santa Fe Trail from Missouri to Santa Fe and then continued down the Camino Real to Chihuahua City. This segment of the old road became known as the Chihuahua Trail, an important commercial link between the United States and Mexico. The Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, or the Royal Road of the Interior, was added to the United States Department of the Interior's National Historic Trail System in 2001. The Camino Real runs 42 miles through El Paso County. A year after the Civil War, Congress passed an act which created two experimental cavalry regiments for service on the western frontiers. African Americans, most of whom had only recently been slaves, put on blue uniforms and filled the ranks of the 9th and 10th U.S. Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments. These men fought hard from Canada to Mexico and from the Rockies to the Mississippi to keep the peace and protect settlers. Yet the very people they strove to protect despised them for their uniform, the color of their skin, or both. In the field and in garrison, these troopers proved to be amazingly effective and often showed great courage. Corporal Ross's heroism, depicted on this monument at Fort Bliss, is but one example of their acknowledged bravery and devotion to duty. Buffalo soldiers fought rustlers, Indians, and bad men. They also strung telegraph wires, built roads, dug wells, and constructed and filled wayside water tanks. 
The major contribution of the Buffalo Soldiers was the permanent construction of the original buildings at many western forts. The Buffalo Soldiers served faithfully from 1867 to 1943 when the U.S. Army deactivated them. Troops from these regiments served here at Fort Bliss and at Forts Quitman, Davis, Stanton, and Selden from 1867 to 1891. Until recently, whenever the winning of the West was discussed, the role of the Buffalo Soldier was largely overlooked. Today, Americans are learning how these troops helped settle the frontier and defended the United States both at home and abroad. It is said that their Indian adversaries called the men Buffalo Soldiers out of respect for their courage and fighting prowess. These black troopers' service did not end with the close of the frontier wars. They distinguished themselves on Cuba's San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt and with General John J. Blackjack Pershing in the Mexican Punitive Expedition of 1916, which included a battle at Carrizal, Chihuahua, Mexico. Tell me how did we survive in this new land, the buffalo soldiers Fort Bliss was originally established in 1848 and is one of the Army's oldest posts. Over its distinguished history, it has been both an infantry post and a cavalry post, as well as an air defense base. Fort Bliss moved numerous times. It started out near the El Paso Convention Center, where it was known as the post opposite El Paso del Norte. The next location was established in 1854 on land leased from James Wiley McGoffin at McGoffinsville and was the first location to be officially designated as Fort Bliss. A major flood of the Rio Grande in 1867 led to the relocation of the fort in 1869 at Camp Concordia, where it remained until 1877. The Army withdrew from El Paso briefly and returned in 1878, where it occupied leased buildings in downtown El Paso. In 1880, the post was moved to Hart's Mill, where they were able to build facilities, and some of these buildings still stand. Fort Bliss moved one last time to the Lenoria Mesa site in 1893. The post's most famous soldier was Brigadier General John J. Blackjack Pershing. Fort Bliss has grown to 1.1 million acres. It is larger than the state of Rhode Island and can accommodate every weapon system in the Army. Excellent ranges and training areas, coupled with the third longest runway in the nation, make Fort Bliss a premier facility for training, mobilizing, and deploying combat forces. Concordia Cemetery has played an important role in El Paso history since the 1850s. The rich, the poor, the famous, the notorious all have a resting place here. The cemetery had its beginnings as a ranch settled by pioneer Hugh Stevenson and his wife Juana Maria Ascarity. Between 1830 and 1840, the settlement came to be known as Concordia, after the Missouri town in which Stevenson was raised. On February 6, 1856, a pet deer gored Juana Escarity Stevenson, and she became the first person to be buried in the Concordia Cemetery. The city of El Paso bought its first part of the cemetery in 1882 as a burial ground for paupers. Today, Concordia has about 65,000 individual graves. The Chinese section includes the graves of early railroad workers who chose to stay in El Paso after helping the railroads reach the city. It is the grave of a notorious gunfighter that gets a lot of the attention at Concordia. John Wesley Harden gained his reputation by supposedly killing more people than Billy the Kid and Jesse James combined. Harden was killed on August 19, 1895 at the Acme Saloon in downtown El Paso by John Selman, a sometime lawman who had been on both sides of the law. Selman, in turn, was killed by lawman George Scarborough. Harden's death is commemorated each August 19th at his grave with a full program of reenactments, storytelling. Maybe I better go back to Texas. 
<laughs> and dancing. Since 1990, the Concordia Heritage Association has been working to preserve and restore this central El Paso historic cemetery. Call for tour information and ask about the annual Walk Through History, where dozens of Concordia's residents are portrayed by reenactors. El Paso was a major stage line terminal for numerous stage and mail operations. The two best known are the Butterfield Overland Mail Company, which went from St. Louis, Missouri to San Francisco, California, and the San Antonio and San Diego Jackass Mail Company that went from San Antonio through El Paso to San Diego. In 1858, Anson Mills was commissioned by the Butterfield Overland Mail Company to build its El Paso stage station. The station served as the dividing point between the eastern and western divisions of a 2,700-mile route, which would span the longest distance over which coach service had ever been attempted. Completed in September 1858, the Overland Building was the largest and best equipped station on the Overland route, and the most imposing structure in El Paso. The Civil War and the consequent removal of the troops stationed at forts along the stage road brought the Butterfield stage to an abrupt halt in March of 1861. During and after the Civil War, the stage building in El Paso served a variety of purposes, including a Confederate Army hospital in 1862, U.S. Army barracks for two years in the late 1870s, and a saloon. Stage passengers and mail continued on the San Antonio to El Paso mail line under various contractors using the stage station located at a site occupied now by the Plaza Hotel and Crest Building. Stage travel virtually disappeared altogether with the arrival of the railroads in 1881. The stage station was demolished in 1898. An important turning point in the history of the Southwest is the 1877 Salt War. Until that time, salt beds had traditionally been considered community property and the salt was free. In 1877, Charles Howard, a former El Paso County judge, bought the land and began to enforce his private ownership of the Guadalupe Salt Lakes 90 miles east of El Paso. Residents in Isleta, Socorro, and San Elizario no longer had free access to the precious mineral. Tensions came to a boil when Howard shot Louis Cardis, an Italian immigrant and state representative that championed public access. Cardis' death was answered by an angry mob that executed Howard by firing squad. With a breakdown of all law and order, the bloody conflict took the lives of at least 11 people, including several Texas Rangers, and there was even talk of a war between the U.S. and Mexico. Federal and state investigations in early 1878 failed to result in any indictments, but led to the reestablishment of Fort Bliss in El Paso. The soldiers enforced an uneasy peace for three years. Private ownership prevailed, and thereafter, fees were charged for the salt. The price of salt collapsed with the arrival of the railroads in 1881, finally putting an end to the salt war. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 set the Rio Grande as the border between the United States and Mexico, leaving the principal community of El Paso del Norte, present-day Juarez, in Mexico. Almost immediately, several small communities sprang up on the north bank of the river. Among them was McGoffinsville, founded by Santa Fe and Chihuahua trader James Wiley McGoffin. When Fort Bliss relocated in 1854, it was on land leased from McGoffin at McGoffinsville. A massive flood of the Rio Grande in 1867 destroyed both the community of McGoffinsville and the fort. The McGoffins started over following the flood and began construction of a large new home in 1875. The McGoffin home, built for Joseph McGoffin, is El Paso's only historic house museum. 
The 20-room adobe home is a prime example of territorial-style architecture. It's built of adobe with Greek Revival detailing. Joseph McGoffin was active in civic and political affairs during the turbulent period that saw El Paso emerge from a raw frontier town to a bustling commercial center. Joseph McGoffin was one of the incorporators of the city in 1873 and served as mayor four times. The home was the social center of El Paso for many years. Elaborate dinner parties, receptions, dances, and concerts were frequently held in the home. Purchased jointly by the city of El Paso and the state of Texas in 1976, the site is operated by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Guided tours provide information on the three generations of McGoffins that lived here. Special events continue to be a large part of the historic home. You can attend a spring garden tea, or a Christmas tea, a candlelight tour, and even take a monthly ghost tour of the McGoffin home, and perhaps meet the original Octavia McGoffin. For information, call 915-533-5147. Chihuahuita, or Little Chihuahua, was settled by Ricardo Brusuelas, who received a land grant from Spanish authorities in 1818 and developed a prosperous ranch. After 1848, when the Rio Grande became part of the U.S.-Mexico border, new settlers arrived to farm the land. With the coming of the Santa Fe Railroad in 1881, Chihuahuita began to grow dramatically. Soon, a crowded urban area, it was designated the city's first ward in 1887. When the wooden Santa Fe Bridge was built in 1892, the area became a major entry point for people and goods from Mexico into the American Southwest. The old Brusuelas land grant eventually became the property of Pedro Garcia, who filed an 1894 claim in a Mexican court that led to the Chamisal land dispute, which was finally settled in 1963. The Mexican Revolution, which began in 1910, brought a surge of refugees north, many to Chihuahuita, and it served as a center of intrigue. It also provided views of the fighting across the Rio Grande. After the revolution, Chihuahuita continued to grow as a gateway to El Paso. At the same time, it became an overcrowded and neglected area, beset with housing and health problems. Renewed interest in the historic neighborhood in the late 20th century resulted in cleanup and rehabilitation efforts. In 1991, the city of El Paso declared Chihuahuita an historic district because of its long and significant history. Today, Chihuahuita is an important reminder of the region's early growth and development. Two different railroads reached El Paso in 1881. First to arrive was the Southern Pacific Railway coming in from the west in May of 1881, followed within weeks by the arrival of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe from the north. The Galveston, Harrisburg, and San Antonio Railroad soon followed. The next year, the tracks of the Mexican Central also reached El Paso. The railroads brought not only goods and services, but a breed of willing and hardy pioneers. Railroad workers were among the first to buy land, build homes, raise families, and build their communities. One of the oldest survivors of America's steam railroad era is locomotive number one. This locomotive was manufactured in 1857 by Brees Nealon and Company of Jersey City, New Jersey. The locomotive served the upper Midwest United States for more than 30 years. By 1889, the locomotive was acquired by the Arizona and Southeastern Railroad Company, which later became the El Paso and Southwestern Railroad. It was converted from a wood burner to a coal burner. Calling it locomotive number one, EP and SW utilized it in the development of mining operations in Bisbee, Arizona, as well as other mining areas in the Southwest. In 1909, old number one was retired after more than 50 years of service. In 1960, the locomotive was donated to Texas Western College, now the University of Texas at El Paso, which placed it at the Centennial Museum. In 2000, the city of El Paso received state and national funds to restore the engine to its 1909 appearance. Locomotive number one took a trip on Interstate 10 to an El Paso rigging company where experts repaired and cleaned the engine and its coal tender. Once restored, it was moved to its downtown site at El Paso's Union Plaza Transit Terminal. 
it is a very rare part of railroad history in the United States. Locomotive number one and a great exhibit about El Paso's railroad history are open to the public at the Transportation Museum downtown in the Union Plaza District. 915-422-3420. Here on April 14, 1881, four men were shot dead in five seconds. Well, I tell you, this is the biggest miscarriage of justice I've ever seen. This is nonsense. This is ridiculous. I tell you what, anybody that's standing up for the Mexicans ought to be hung. George, I hope you ain't talking about me now. If the shoe fits, wear it. El Paso, then, was one of the wildest towns in the Old West. Johnny Hale, gunman, rancher, and cattle rustler, was suspected of the murder of three young Mexican vaqueros near Cañutillo. An inquest, ordered by the Justice of the Peace, was in progress nearby, with Gus Kremka, ex-Texas Ranger, acting as translator. Well, I tell you, this is the biggest miscarriage of justice I've ever seen. This is nonsense. At recess, Hale, enraged by Kremka's translation of Spanish testimony, shot and killed him. Immediately, City Marshal Dallas Stoudenmire went into action. His first shot killed an innocent bystander. His second shot got Hale. His third shot killed George Campbell, a Hale supporter and former Marshal of El Paso who had drawn his gun. Quick justice indeed on the streets of old El Paso. John Wesley Hardin was born in Bonham, Texas in 1853. He was named for the founder of Methodism. Wes Hardin grew into a cowboy, outlaw, and family man who claimed to have killed more than 40 men. Hardin was an unusual sort of gunslinger and considered himself a pillar of society who killed only those who needed killing. Hardin served 17 years in state prison for murder, was pardoned, returned to his hometown, and attempted to meld into society. After his failure at politics and law, he moved to El Paso where he opened a law office in May of 1895. Three months after opening the office, Hardin was killed by John Selman, an El Paso city constable, in a feud that was spawned by what most folks felt was competitive jealousy between two gunfighters of note, namely Selman and Hardin. For centuries, the Rio Grande has been molded and shaped by the humans living along its banks. Informal irrigation systems have existed along the life-sustaining river from the Spanish colonial period. As early as the 1840s, area farmers began more modern improvements on these systems. By 1889, El Paso developers needed a means to efficiently provide water to farmers in the El Paso Valley. The El Paso Irrigation Company began construction on the Franklin Canal the following year. Completed in 1912, the canal began at the International Dam and extended five miles, paralleling the Rio Grande on its north bank and continuing through downtown El Paso. Demands on the canal increased as the area's population grew. Modifications have been made to the Franklin Canal throughout the 20th century. It is an important element in the history of water control along the U.S.-Mexico border. El Pasoans initially obtained their domestic water from these acequias, or open irrigation ditches, and later from the Aguadores, water carriers who delivered fresh water as depicted in this mural. In 1882, Sylvester Watts built the first El Paso waterworks. He pumped water out of the Rio Grande and stored it in a reservoir at this site. Later, Watts dug a well near the river that became the main supply source. 
In 1910, the city purchased the waterworks and began major renovations to the system, including the construction of the pumping unit at this site and the expansion of the Sunset Heights Reservoir. The El Paso Public Service Board was established in 1952 to oversee the city's water system. A major change in the course of the Rio Grande in the 1860s in the El Paso Ciudad Juarez Valley transferred about one square mile from the south side of the river to the north side and resulted in an international land dispute as tough and thorny as its namesake, the native Chamiso Bush. The 100-year-old Chamizal dispute was finally settled by treaty between the United States of America and the United Mexican States when the President of the U.S., Lyndon B. Johnson, and the President of Mexico, Adolfo Lopez Mateos, met and commemorated the Chamizal Treaty in El Paso on September 25, 1964. The 1964 treaty provides for relocation of the channel of the Rio Grande, which transferred 437 acres to Mexico, and a transfer of 193 acres to the United States on Cordova Island, formerly an enclave of Mexican territory on the north side of the river channel, plus an equal area downstream from the island. Both Mexico and the United States created national parks on the land. In El Paso, it is called Chamizal National Memorial and commemorates the 1964 treaty peacefully settling a border dispute between two nations. This monument features informal gardens, including replicas of several famous Mexican sites. Chamizal National Memorial includes a state-of-the-art theater, as well as a museum with permanent exhibits telling the Cordova Island and the Chamizal Treaty stories. The adjacent building houses the Los Paisanos Art Gallery, which has changing exhibits. The Chamizal National Memorial is host to many big attractions, including summer concerts. The Chamizal National Memorial is located at 800 South San Marcial. This is Fusselman Canyon, which follows the Fusselman Canyon Fault, a major natural cut into the Franklin Mountains. For centuries, it has served as a natural corridor for the movement of people, goods, and livestock, legally and illegally, between the river valley to the west and the desert basin to the east. The canyon also served as a source of seasonal water, plants, and animals for the many Native Americans who inhabited this region. It is named in honor of Charles H. Fusselman, Texas Ranger and U.S. Deputy Marshal. In the late 19th century, El Paso was a booming town, but outlying areas were still lawless. On April 17, 1890, local rancher John Barnes reported that his horses and cattle had been stolen. Later that day, Charles Fusselman was deputized and led Barnes and city policeman George Harold into the Franklin Mountains to chase the rustlers. The thieves intended to drive the horses and cattle through the canyon along the path of today's Woodrow Bean Trans Mountain Road through Smuggler's Gap at the top of the canyon and then into the Rio Grande Bosque near Cañoteo, Texas. Fusselman's party captured one of the rustlers before encountering the outlaw's camp. There they met with a barrage of gunfire and Fusselman was shot and killed. The outlaws escaped after the outnumbered Barnes and Harold left their prisoner and fled the scene. Fusselman's body was later recovered and taken to Lagarto, Texas where he was buried. For the next 10 years, Lawman pursued the rustlers. Geronimo Pata, the outlaw leader, was finally arrested, tried, and convicted of Fusselman's murder. He was legally hanged in January 1900 in El Paso. The canyon became known as Fusselman Canyon in honor of the slain deputy and ranger. Presidents William Howard Taft and Porfirio Diaz met in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez on October 16, 1909, marking the first time in U.S. history that a sitting president traveled outside the U.S. 
It was described by the local press as the most eventful diplomatic event in the history of the two nations. The meetings were hailed as a veritable pageant of military splendor, social brilliance, courtly formality, official protocol, and patriotic fervor. In June 1909, President Taft wanted the Diaz government to continue support of American investments in Mexico. Taft suggested a meeting with the Mexican president at El Paso, and President Diaz readily accepted. Diaz was convinced that his appearance in the El Paso Ciudad Juarez area would restore his lost popularity. Taft arrived in El Paso on the morning of October 16th and attended a presidential breakfast at the St. Regis Hotel. At the Chamber of Commerce building, the El Paso committee, taking the fullest advantage of the opportunity of the moment, presented El Paso's case regarding the Elephant Butte Dam project in New Mexico, which had been dormant for several years. Taft agreed to give the matter his personal attention, a hopeful sign that the project was still alive. The dam was essential to El Paso's future water supply, and it was completed in 1916. The meetings were planned in the greatest detail by the U.S. State Department and the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They included elaborate arrangements for the protection of the two presidents and three train car loads of flowers brought from Guadalajara for the Juarez banquet. With the presentation of gold goblets to the presidents as gifts from the city of El Paso, the evening in Mexico came to an end. Taft returned to El Paso to board a train for San Antonio. The American Smelting and Refining Company, ASARCO, has refined lead, copper, and other ores at this location since 1899. The need for a large labor pool brought in thousands of Mexican immigrants. These workers established homes for their families on company land around the smelter and developed a dynamic community called Smelter Town, or La Esmelda. Smelter Town grew into a small city within a city and was home to a Sarco brick and cement plants and a limestone quarry. The settlement was divided into Upper and Lower Smelter Town, or El Alto and El Bajo, and within these areas were smaller barrios. Today only one remains, La Calavera, or Skull Canyon, which is along the road to the Smelter Town Cemetery. Smelter Town was home to its own YMCA branch and schools, most notably E.B. Jones School. Throughout the area, residents established organizations, stores, restaurants, and other businesses, and named streets after residents who died in military service during World War II. The San Jose de Cristo Rey Catholic Church served the residents as a place for worship and social and community activity. Parishioners made regular pilgrimages to the top of Cerro de Muleros, now known as Mount Cristo Rey, and began the creation of the Cristo Rey Monument, erected in 1940. In the early 1970s, after environmental officials found high levels of lead contamination in the soil, community buildings were raised and families were relocated. Today, an annual reunion brings former residents together to remember the once vibrant and bustling smelter town. The El Paso Poor Farm was established here in 1915. John O'Shea, a wealthy farmer and businessman whose farm was nearby, assumed operation of the farm. His wife, Agnes O'Shea, was in charge of the residence. John O'Shea died in 1929, and the couple's daughter, Helen O'Shea Kelleher, came from her home in San Antonio to operate the farm with her mother. The farm was scheduled to be closed in 1929, but with the troubled times of the Depression era, its population grew. Renamed Rio Vista Farm, the poor farm hosted a variety of public welfare programs beginning in the 1930s. It operated under the Texas Transient Bureau and later the Federal Works Progress Administration. A temporary base for a Civilian Conservation Corps unit in 1936, the farm continued to shelter hundreds of homeless and destitute adults and children. From 1951 to 1964, the farm was used as a reception and processing center for the Bracero program, which brought Mexican laborers to work in the lower valley of El Paso and other agricultural areas in the U.S. New federal welfare programs and state law reduced the population of the poor farm to four, and it was closed in 1964. 
Unlike other Texas County poor farms, Rio Vista followed a familial rather than institutional model, accepting neglected and abandoned children in addition to the adult indigent population. In 2000, this building and wall were constructed at Rio Vista as a set for the movie Traffic. In later life, Helen O'Shea Kelleher cited the 50 years she spent with the more than 4,000 children of the Rio Vista poor farm as her proudest accomplishment. The city of Socorro now uses the Rio Vista Farms property for many community programs. The buildings look like ancient fortresses, but they make up one of the most distinctive university campuses in the Southwest. This is the University of Texas at El Paso. Its unique architectural style is patterned after the Himalayan country of Bhutan, and how it came to be built on the U.S.-Mexico border is just part of the university's intriguing history. In 1913, the Texas legislature approved the creation of a state school of mines and metallurgy in El Paso. A year later, the school opened on the site of a former military academy near Fort Bliss, donated to the state by the citizens of El Paso. After a fire in 1916, the school moved to a new location. When the wife of the school's dean saw photos of Bhutan in a National Geographic magazine, she suggested that the Bhutanese style would fit El Paso's mountainous terrain, and UTEP's architectural identity was set. Old Main was built with a red tile roof, high sloping walls, decorative brickwork, and wide overhangs that have been part of the campus architecture ever since. In a few years, the mining school joined the University of Texas, added liberal arts courses and bachelor's degrees. In the 1940s, master's degrees were offered, and the school's name was changed to Texas Western College. In 1966, Texas Western made history when legendary coach Don Haskins led an all-black starting team to victory in the NCAA championship game. Today, the University of Texas at El Paso is a major research university, offering more than a dozen doctoral degrees. UTEP is a national leader in educating Hispanics, the country's fastest growing group. And UTEP keeps its architectural tradition alive, building high-tech labs inside the ancient style of Bhutan. Perhaps no single structure on post represents Fort Bliss better than Quarters No. 1, also known as Pershing House. From its completion in 1910 until today, the original field officer's quarters has been a source of community pride and national, and at times international, interest. Its history is a brief encyclopedia of almost a century of the American military, with emphasis on its social and diplomatic aspects. Quarters No. 1 is an American architectural statement of universal charm prominently situated in the midst of a vast international military complex. It has been continuously occupied for almost a century. Although Quarters No. 1 is not the oldest building at Fort Bliss, it was the first commanding officer's quarters and the first building of its architectural style. The building has provided essential living and recreation space for post commanders and other officers serving on the United States and Mexican border since Pershing House was built in 1910. Fort Bliss Quarters No. 1 is named for General John J. Blackjack Pershing, who was the home's most famous resident. The Fort Bliss Museum on Post features Army history in El Paso from the establishment of U.S. military presence in 1848 to the present. Exhibits focus on desert warfare beginning with the punitive expedition in the early 1900s. Air defense is a large part of the Fort Bliss Museum and includes field anti-aircraft weapons inside the museum and some of the Army's larger weapons on the grounds. The Fort Bliss Museum offers school tours, demonstrations, living history programs, and hands-on activities for children. Call 915-568 4518.